I'm Zainab Badawi, and it's my great pleasure to be moderating the Governor's Seminar at this um, annual ADB gathering. So, um, what we're going to be discussing today is, we all know that globalization has greatly benefited Asia and the Pacific region by helping them develop, you know, economically, but um, there have also been some issues. We've seen the deepening of inequalities and also compromising social and environmental integrity at times. So what we are discussing in this session is that Asia and the Pacific region cannot take advantage of globalization in the old way. They've got to harvest really new technologies to try to ensure as the name of this uh, seminar says that we can work towards a climate friendly globalization so we're going to be looking at uh, the strategies which will help us do that with my uh, lineup of um, governors a representation of some of the governors starting first with our host nation the beautiful country um, of Georgia. I've been before. Those of you who haven't and are a little bit disappointed with the weather, sorry, Governor, um, you must come back because it's a beautiful, beautiful city and it's a wonderful place to wander around and it's, uh, you know, really, really enjoy the Georgian hospitality, which we all are. Um, Governor, you're the Honourable Lasha Khutsishvili, Minister of Finance for Georgia and also Governor um, at the Asian Development Bank for Georgia. So you please kick off for us and let's hear about new strategies, climate change, new digital technologies, geopolitics, you're in a very tough geopolitical neighbourhood, and other forces are affecting international trade and investment ties, possibly, possibly to the detriment of future growth. So in your view, what, what's your opinion on the future of global trade and production links? And how do you think regional economies should try to prepare to navigate the challenges that um, have been thrown up? Because Georgia, of course, sits at a very strategic um, crossroads. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zainab. So as all of you know, the, the uh, motto of the ADB's 57th uh, annual meeting is Bridge to the Future. And this motto has been selected uh, uh, very naturally from the Georgia's perspective, as the historically we've been developing as a gateway and a meeting point of different cultures and traditions. Uh, this has been forming a bridge of its kind between uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, and the culture and tradition mostly travel with the trade of goods through the uh, trade corridors. Many of them, historically Silk Road, the Middle Corridor, and others. Uh, challenges and opportunities differ. Uh, the trade roads keep the value chain move. Uh, the trade roads are also the first that uh, react, uh, divert or seek alternatives when the blockages arise or constraints increase uh, or the better opportunities uh, show up. So this is why it's extremely important that the participants of the trade roads work uh, in a synergy, uh, harmonize trade uh, procedures, uh, build uh, infrastructure, eliminate and maximum, maximally minimize the trade barriers and facilitate the uh, flow. Though it's also not rare, uh, rather than uh, frequent, that the geopolitics or the uh, natural, national, natural disasters uh, or uneven developments of capacity prevent this pass to uh, run smoothly. And the f future of global trade and production links obviously are influenced by various uh, factors like uh, climate change, uh, digital technology and geopolitics which can impact the growth itself. Uh, to navigate the challenges, uh, uh, regional economies should focus on enhancing resilience, uh, for, uh, fostering the innovation and promoting sustainable uh, practices. So embracing the digital transformation investing in green uh, technology and strengthening the uh, regional uh, cooperation 
uh, through the trade agreements can uh, help mitigate the risk and seize opportunities in this uh, evolving trade landscape. So in general, Georgia is a big promoter and so uh, big promoter of the free trade agreements uh, and so the elimination of the barriers. So Georgia has uh, 48 free trade agreements in, in total, uh, in including the European Union and China together uh, and other cut, cut countries as, as well. So the Georgia has recently received the EU candidate status. Uh, that in economic terms also means that access to the larger markets and more uh, streamlined uh, processes. So we're working very actively with, with uh, our neighboring countries in the middle corridor to streamline the further border and crossing uh, procedures. For example, one of the projects with the support of the ADB, uh, we're working on a completely new concept uh, of the single window border crossing point uh, with Azerbaijan, then that's a very important uh, uh, project. And just to summarize that the future of global trade and production, uh, production links will require a proactive approach from the regional economies uh, for focusing on the resilience, innovation, sustainability, and collaboration to navigate in this quite challenging uh, uh, pose by climate change, uh, digital technology and geop geopolitical shifts. Uh, participants, uh, all uh, uh, this chain, uh, no matter from which part, so the governments, businesses, MDBs and others, so all we need to work uh, and to find the way how to work together uh, to be more and more flexible uh, to adjust uh, as the new challenges may arise. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Governor. So just very quickly, I know that one of the ways that Georgia is trying to go towards a climate-friendly globalization is in the area of energy. And uh, I think you, you are focusing very much on hydropower here in Georgia. About 80% of your renewable sources, you're hoping, will come from that. So I just wonder if you could give us just a paragraph on that in terms of, you know, climate-friendly globalization. So the uh, energy is something that takes much uh, importance, especially for the last period. So energy security and energy independence, uh, in some cases, even goes through the country's independence. So the attention to, to, to the energy security is something that uh, uh, most of the countries are dealing with. Uh, and on the other side, uh, I can say that so the, the experience which Georgia has in this side uh, is quite important. You re re rightly mentioned that electricity production in Georgia, uh, from the total el electricity production, more than 80%, 80%, uh, is renewable and green, mm. mainly uh, comes from the hydro mm -hmm. uh, and also quite uh, big impo quite big interest from from the private sector in the wind and solar as well so uh, there are uh, several directions uh, from which we are developing so I would like to mention one one of the very important uh, project we are we are waiting from the World Bank the feasibility study in a few months two or three months period so this will be finalized and this project is uh, also under EU investment plan and one of the flagship projects. This is a Lexi undersea uh, electricity and internet cable, which should connect Georgia and not only Georgia, but the whole region, South Caucasus region, uh, electro system to, to the European grid. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, this actually serves the purpose to, to reach the, the uh, energy security and energy independence, but on the other side, so this this is very important from the uh, connectivity side, mm. as you know that we do mm. not have the land border with the, with, with the European Union, and so the, this is this will be the, the first connection. We will very interesting. Connect yeah. Georgia and the European Union, but that's that's the one side. But from the other side, it's also the huge motivation for the local production uh, right. of the electricity here in Georgia. Mm. So first of all, it, it was to mention that the potential we have evaluated only 35% is 
uh, used. Uh, so we, we have used only 35% from, from the uh, hydro uh, yeah. resources. That means that it's, there's a lot more potential yeah, there. It's potential yeah. to double and triple right. the, the, the yeah. production. And on the other side, so the, the co connectivity to the big European market yeah. also the boost the lo lo local right. uh, protection uh, production uh, of the electricity. I can share very uh, small insights uh, about, about the Georgian local local electricity what? production. Uh, on it, so for example, the, for the we had a quite e interesting incentive scheme for yeah. the uh, local uh, uh, electricity production in Georgia, and so the, we had uh, two open auctions yeah. uh, for, for 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 the uh, electricity generation, and the, on the both uh, auctions, so the demand from the private sector was uh, twice much than we offered the market. So it means that this all this project together so gives the huge very good chance country right. to reach the uh, energy security and to, to be the exporter of the renewable energy mm. to mm. the European Union. Very clear example there of climate friendly globalization, a very clear strategic policy. You've got all those rivers here in Georgia, haven't you, to exploit for your hydropower. So um, our um, next governor is Rose Nakanaga, who is the Secretary of Finance and Administration in the Federated States of Micronesia and also the Governor for Micronesia. Micronesia, um, of course, as most of you know, is a collection of about 300 islands or more, you said, roughly, a population of about 110,000 uh, people, and I think most of your revenues come from fees for fishing. But, Governor, your country, like many other small islands in the Pacific are very vulnerable to the devastating effects of climate change and you so often lack the resources needed to handle these daunting challenges. So I wonder if you would share with us your views on how urgent it is for the international community to step up its support to vulnerable countries and communities such as yours and how can we all help make this happen including the Asian Development Bank? Thank you. Well, I am honored to address this in battle on the pressing issue of climate resilience in the Pacific nations. Indeed, it is uh, uh, the vulnerable, vulnerability of our region to the devastated, devastating effect of climate change uh, cannot be overstated. Rising sea levels, extreme weather events, uh, and ocean acidification are threatening not only for the economy or, and ecosystem, but also uh, the very livelihood of our people. The urgency for the international communities to step up its support to vulnerable countries and communities such as uh, those in the Pacific cannot be overstated. I have firsthand witnessed immense uh, changes faced by our nation that brought upon us by climate change. Uh, I'll just name a few like a damage to our infrastructure uh, during um, typhoons, uh, to like utility lines, schools, and hospitals. Uh, raising of sea level, forcing, other pe forcing our people to migrate from the communities near the shorelines. Uh, king tide damaging outer island homes and salt water inundation into farmlands on the Atoll Islands, creating food security, coral bleaching and depleting uh, our fish stocks, severe trout creating water shortages and food prices due to its Im adverse impact on agriculture productivity. Uh, my country is currently undergoing a state of emergency now uh, due to El Nino. Uh, many of our people depend on farmlands and ocean for food supply. Many, uh, we also face the potential of uh, loss to our major uh, revenue source, which is fishing, license, 
if the, we, the climate change continues the fish that we will eventually migrate out of our territories. What makes this more difficult is that we do not have the financial resources to address the climate change impact on, on our own. We need the support of the international communities to help us respond to our plans. We already developed uh, what they call the National De uh, Determined Contribution, or NDCs, and as required under the Paris Agreement. We have also developed, we, we are also developing our National Adaptation Plan. We recently uh, adapted a building code to support uh, our resilience building. We are working hard on climate proving our, our critical infrastructures. One of the biggest initiatives underlie is the climate resilience road investment that both the ADB and the World Bank are supporting. Based on estimate from the IMF, uh, FSM would Everson has a financing need of about 400 to 500 million dollars for the next 15 years to address our climate investments. Clearly, the impact of climate change are immediate, and the window of opportunity to mitigate them is rapidly closing. Therefore, it's imperative that the international community mobilize additional grant financing technical assistance and capacity building to help Micronesia and other vulnerable countries and communities adapt to the, uh, and build resilience to climate change. In this regard, FSA, I mean, ADB plays uh, uh, an important role in, uh, in supporting the Pacific Island nations in their climate resilience effort. The ADB, with its extensive ex, uh, experience and expert in the region, is well positioned to provide ta tailored financial solution, technical assistance, and knowledge sharing to address the unique challenges faced by vulnerable countries like Micronesia. ADB can help mobilize additional resources and facilities, uh, facilitate access to climate finance to the Pacific Island region. Uh, ADB is um, a national accredited entity to the um, TCF. They can help um, or should help us access TCF funding and implement more large-scale climate resilience uh, projects. Many Pacific Island uh, struggle with access to requirements for climate, uh, climate fund, uh, yeah, for our climate funds. Uh, the emergency uh, financing support by ADB, like the Asian Development Bank Disaster Response Fund, has worked well with us in providing quick dispersed grants mm -hmm. to assist us in response, like previously, uh, for the COVID-19 and other disasters. We welcome continued support like this. We look forward to continue uh, collaboration. By working together, we can address the daunting challenges posed by climate change and secure a sustainable future for generations to come. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed, Governor. A bleak picture you paint there. I know that some of the low-lying islands and some of the other islands, some are affected by drought, others the El Nino with the heavy rainfall, and um, you're really just responding with disaster emergency measures all the time, whereas you say very clearly you need to get access to those funds in order to... Uh, build your resilience and I know you've only been in position since October so you've rolled up your sleeves and already had to get uh, working on it so we've heard a couple of our governors so far I want to remind all you delegates here that you're also part of this conversation you all know about pigeonhole don't you but let me just remind you um, 
It's a Q&A session. It's a very simple, interactive mobile website. You can submit your questions to the panel of speakers. You've heard a couple of them now already. Maybe one or two things they've said have triggered some ideas in your heads. If you have a smartphone, a tablet, or a laptop computer with you, just launch your internet browser and enter www.pigeonhole.com at into the address bar and as you know i think you can see it there our event pass code is tbilisi 2024 in block capitals all one word so please do put your questions there and the questions with the highest um, number of votes stand the best chance of um, <clears throat> being responded to let's go to our third um, governor speaker abul hassan mahmoud ali you're busy reading your notes there, but I'm coming to you. So, of course, you're the Minister of Finance of Bangladesh and also mm -hmm. the governor um, for Bangladesh. And look, you know, we, we know that um, global value chains have allowed countries in Asia, particularly not, not the Pacific as much, to, um, it, you know, it, to shift. We've seen a shift of some of the more polluting parts of uh, the production process go towards Asia and as I said at the outset this cannot continue and so we need to see um, how the region can take um, globalization into a new way making sure that it's you know nodding in the direction of climate friendly policies so with the new generation of industrial policies to meet this end which you've introduced in Bangladesh while intending to safeguard your national economic security and incentivize the development of clean industries. This, however, might cause harm to international trade and the expansion of global value chains, GVCs. So how should regional economies cope with these kind of tensions and emerging risks? The uh, uh, opening up of the of an economy to uh, modernization, to uh, towards uh, exchange with uh, another economy, uh, both working under their own systems, own ways, but still there will be uh, benefits when uh, these two economies are going to operate under uh, uh, operation. So, which uh, uh, between themselves, between these two economies, then the, uh, there will be economies of scale, there will be benefit, and then the, uh, uh, the whole idea of uh, cooperating uh, will generate new forces uh, towards uh, integration. So, this will ultimately bring them together and uh, uh, will yield uh, benefits which were not available earlier. So that is why, uh, you know, this kind of uh, cooperation and uh, uh, benefit, benefits, uh, it will uh, ultimately it will lead to uh, uh, better uh, uh, results in both their economies. So, Ultimately, it will be a win-win situation for both economies. So this is why, uh, you know, everybody wants to uh, have tap, you know, energies or uh, uh, benefits from cooperation. Uh, uh, to put it another way, that uh, if they are uh, working on their separate ways, then uh, that benefit will not be available. and. Uh, both will be uh, losing ultimately. So this is the general idea that uh, if we can uh, get them to cooperate with each other, uh, their total uh, production will, uh, will go up and uh, it will be beneficial for both the economies. So this is the whole idea. Give us an idea of, of the kind of industrial policies that you are pursuing in Bangladesh. Perhaps give us a bit more on that. The, uh, uh, when uh, two economies are uh, working together, uh, instead of competing separately, then their, their uh, total income, total production will go up. And uh, as a result, both will benefit. 
So that is the uh, primary lesson for uh, cooperation uh, between two economies. Mm. So uh, that's the general idea. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Sri Mulyani Indrawati, Minister of Finance of Indonesia and of course the governor uh, for Indonesia. We know that Asia generates more than 50% of um, global annual carbon um, emissions. So while Asia has benefited from globalization, its successful integration with global value chains has also increased the region's contribution, of course, to emissions. So in what ways can countries like Indonesia make cross-border production links more environmentally friendly? What are you doing in Indonesia? Well, thank you, Zainab. I think this is very important. All countries want to continue their development journey, but they also fully recognize that climate change is now becoming a biggest threat for, for humanity and also threatening many countries, including many small islands like Micronesia. So for Indonesia, Indonesia is an, on the 11th rank on the CO2 emission globally. But if you look at the per capita, we are on a 24th rank. We fully aware that for Indonesia to continue our journey to become high income country, there will be industrialization, more infrastructure will be developed, mobility of the people, capital, that will generate uh, CO2. So how we are going to combine between continue this development journey and lowering our own CO2 emission, including through this globalization in which we are doing the trade relation. The first is, of course, if you can greener your energy. I mean, that is the upstream. If your energy becoming green and renewable, relying more, then all the downstream that is the manufacturing, transportation is going to be less CO2 emission. And for Indonesia, this is both opportunity and a challenge, Zainab. Because we are very rich in uh, fossil fuel. We have gas, we have oil, we have uh, coal, but we also have a lot of renewable potential. So for us, changing our energy from more polluted to become less polluted, that means you have to have the energy transition scenario. And this is the one that we work closely with ADB as one of the MDBs, but because it will cost Indonesia 265 billion US dollar. And that's really big, only for transforming the energy. So the discussion now in Indonesia, which is starting to implement and scenario building as well as preparing the project with the ATB on this energy transition mechanism, including we also have the partnership of uh, just energy transition partnership. This is how to design Indonesia to become energy security, energy affordability, and energy sustainability. Three objectives that need to be achieved. And we discussed quite a lot on how we can retire coal earlier, but at the same time also build more renewable. So these are the way that we are now working to greening our industries at the very upstream that is on a energy generation. The second one, Indonesia is also the biggest tropical forest in the world, just like Brazil. And some of this contention between managing and preserving the tropical forest vis-a-vis -vis we want to industrialize or take the economic benefit of that. And Indonesia is also the biggest palm oil producer in the world. So that generating a lot of concern regarding the sustainability of the forest, while at the same time Indonesia want to create more value from this. And that's why for the Indonesia now, the palm oil industry need to be certified. We are implementing the verification in order for us to be able more than 5.5 million hectares now of the palm oil that certified in order for us to give the guarantee that they are producing without violating the environmental friendly. So that, that's most important on the second one, which is related to the palm oil. The third one is for Indonesia. We know that now when the world want to become more, less CO2, less CO2 emission, all country now developing the electric vehicle. And the electric vehicle need 
the electric battery, but battery in this case. Indonesia again have a huge natural resource including nickel, which is considered as a strategic mineral. So we built the value chains within this, the electric vehicle and electric uh, uh, battery in order for Indonesia to be able to continue also become the biggest value chains within this electric vehicle and the battery, which then can, everybody can still mobile, mobile with their transportation vehicle, but less CO2. And that certainly cannot become a country stand alone. We are part of the supply chains, whether this is on a European base, United States base, or even the, the China base in this case, or Korean base, Japanese base. So these are all the big mm. vehicle producer. And then the last one, is, which is important, is actually to build the policy as well as regulatory. The carbon market is still very fragmented globally. So Indonesia also starting to build this carbon market. We also developing the taxonomy within the ASEAN. We work together in ASEAN 10 to make sure that the taxonomy for this private capital when they are participating in this green finance, they are having a more confidence that, oh, I am complying with the regulatory framework, whether this is on a capital market, financial, which is based on the banking, or bonds market. These are all comply with the more explicit regulatory uh, through this taxonomy. Indonesia also building our own carbon market. We work together with our close neighbor, for example, with Singapore on exporting more renewable in this case because Indonesia is very close to Singapore, Malaysia and so on. So these are all an area that Indonesia will continue relying on the globalization. We want to see this trade and especially because ASEAN and Asia in general is becoming a prosper and brighter spot of the global economy because of this trade and investment but we cannot ignore the climate change as a threat. And that's why we need to continue doing business through threat and investment, but we have to produce less CO2. Thank you very much. Greening trade and investment, very important. Thank you. You've raised a number of very important things, the carbon pricing mechanism and the importance of decarbonizing production procedures. Thank you. Um, President Massa, so uh, the... Um, ADB, of course, has long been a champion of regional cooperation and integration. So I wonder what you think the role of um, regional cooperation will be in mitigating climate risks while maximizing the benefits of global value chains and cross-border production networks. Mm. Yes, thank you, Zainal. Mm. Uh, let me start by saying that the so-called GVC, Global Value Chain, has been an integral component of Asia's economic uh, development over the past few decades. I, I don't think uh, anybody could uh, deny that. So driven by increasing trade and new world uh, FDI, uh, integration into global and regional value chains has been a major driver of economic growth and industrialization in Asia. I said both global and regional value chains. Because in, in my mind, you know, any kind of regionalism, regional uh, integration effort, as long as they are open and transparent, it would not compete with globalization. It would complement globalization. So I think they are compatible with each other, if they are really open. So by embracing open regionalism, Asia's regional cooperation and integration has progressed in tandem uh, with its deeper integration into global uh, production networks so far. Yet, Asia faces several emerging challenges, as you know, uh, in coping with the environmental impact of global value chains, which means you know, global value chains related uh, emission, as uh, Zainab said, has uh, grown rapidly, more rapidly uh, than the other source of emissions. So we need to decarbonize uh, the global and also regional value chains. Uh, as a result, uh, uh, developing Asia now accounts for almost half, actually more than 50 percent of global emissions associated with global value chains and also regional value chains. Our region is also increasingly vulnerable to climate risks at the same time, uh, such as extreme, extremely, extreme uh, weather events and shocks, 
that can in turn impact upon Asian role in global production networks. Uh, you know, everybody saw what happened in Pakistan two years ago, for example. So, and also growing geopolitical tensions also added add to the complexity in the forging a feasible and desirable GVC landscape in the future. So here, regional cooperation and integration can help in navigating these challenges, in my view. Regional cooperation can be an important driver in helping economic uh, mitigate uh, climate risks and adapt to climate change, helping to green production networks. Enhanced regional cooperation can help meeting its uh, negative uh, consequences of a fracturing a global economy, how is uh, regional cooperation helping develop resilient uh, regional value chains against potential global economic shocks. Actually, regional cooperation can help in greening value chains in several ways. First, evidence suggests that the environmental provisions in regional trade and investment agreements uh, can help uh, green production networks by lowering emissions associated with production facilities and international trade. Expanding uh, such provisions and aligning regula regulations and standards across borders could further help green regional value chains. Second, stepping up information sharing and the pooling of climate change resources, particularly related to technologies, uh, can facilitate the trans transition to green production networks. And finally, third, by encouraging the regional diversification of supply chains, regional cooperation can help build their resilience against climate-related risks. Thank you very much indeed for that overview and the <clears throat> steps that you set out here. So we are getting some uh, questions in from our delegates. I'm going to go to the one that's got the most votes so far, and that's this question. And have a listen. Um, please, governors, and see, uh, Mr. President, to see who would like to kick off on this one. How can countries leverage green financing, such as green bonds, for infrastructure projects having climate co-benefits? Well, okay, thank you. Sri Mulyani. <laughs> well, Indonesia have uh, an experience in issuing the green bond. Uh, I think now we reach um, more than six billion globally of issuing okay. this. By issuing the green bond, definitely, you are, definitely there is an additional compliant cost because you cannot issue like conventional bond without pledging anything and uh, this is based on Indonesia reputation, healthy fiscal system, rating, and then they are going to buy our bond. When you issue green bond, you have to make sure the underlying of this green is there. So that's why you call it the co-benefit in this case is making sure that the underlying of this bond is truly green. And that's why we have to discuss with whoever going to receive this money for what kind of investment that can be verified that they are, that they are green enough. If it is financing for renewable, it's going to be easy because then everybody knows that, oh, this is for the green project. If it is for the transmission, they are going to be a little bit mixed because this transmission of the electricity, they are for coal, they are also for the fossil fuel, but also for the renewable. Transmission cannot actually differentiate, oh, this is only for the electricity, which is based on the green. So this is becoming less green. In Indonesian case, we are also discussing about, for example, retiring coal. How retiring coal that will need financing but if we are going to get the financing, this financing of retiring coal can be considered green or less green or purple <laughs> or any other number of sure. color that you can choose. So we are actually discussing this within this taxonomy in order for us to be able to, on the one hand, signaling to the capital market that Indonesia can issue these green bonds as a financial instrument to support uh, our climate change agenda. But at the same time, we need to also talk and discuss with the rating agency, the bondholder, including the standard mm -hmm. setter. Yeah. So that they are not going to then confuse or easily judging well. that a certain project or a certain instrument is not complied to the green while actually they are needed. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed for that insight. Yes, President Massa. Can I just one, make one question to Minister Srimuriani. ADB is also really encouraging green bond insurance and yep. uh, investing in, in, in them and also encouraging you know, a, a, a member government to issue as much as green bond. But based on your experience, rich experience, uh, how about the pricing of green bond? Is it cheaper or more expensive? President Asakawa is actually voicing the concern of countries like us. We think that if you issue the green bond, you are going to have a premium, which is the yield should be less, or in this case, the price should be higher, because a lot of this is related to the global public good. But the bondholder is not having this kind of attitude yet, unfortunately, President. Right. Asakawa. And that's why MDB, like ADB, need to influence the bond market and the standard set. All right, there's there is no greenium, we call it, no premium because of you are green. You just pay exactly the same other conventional bond. Mm -hmm. So that's the market All failure. Right. Thank you. Um, Governor? So the, in case of the Georgia, so uh, actually the capital market is something that we are developing now. So it, it means that we are developing the instruments uh, of the financing in general, other than the banking sector. So that, that's something that we are doing together with the uh, MDBs, with the, B, with the ADB and other, other MDBs. So there are also uh, several examples of uh, issuing green bonds uh, on the local market. The scale is not uh, big, uh, but so the to consider that it's just, we are in the, just the starting point, so it's quite quite promising for, for right. the future. So that's the case that we, together with the assistance of the MDBs, we are developing this direction. Excellent, clear role there for the MDBs. Okay, um, President Asakawa, there's a question for you here, um, or I'm going to put it to you, which is GVCs benefit Asia, but may contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. In the ADB's view, what can countries do to green GVCs while maintaining their development goals? Yes, uh, in order to benefit from globalization, global value chain, of course, uh, we have to also uh, look at some negative aspect of globalization, which is uh, more in you know, emission of CO2 gas and so on, uh, coming from global and also regional value chains. Um, for many countries in the region, foreign invest uh, and the trade linked to GVC have helped to transform their economies and ge uh, generate growth. That's, that's true. Uh, GVC have also proven relatively resilient to various shocks, notably the global financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic, for example. But as uh, Minister Suleimani also mentioned, the fragmentation of production processes across countries, however, means that GVC could increase global greenhouse gas emissions. Moreover, economic efficiency often leads to heavily polluting uh, production uh, stages being outsourced to countries uh, with weak environmental regulations. So despite the environmental challenges associated with GVC, uh, there are several policy responses that can make their greener while maintaining their development role. First, uh, greening uh, value chains call for uh, global cooperation. Sustaining environmental commitments uh, through multilateral cooperation such as the UNFCCC remains very important. Yeah. Second, trade agreement, bilateral trade agreements uh, can play an important role in harmonizing environmental standards and incentivizing the adoption of uh, uh, sustainable practices uh, through provisions encouraging the use of cleaner technologies. Third, Carbon pricing mechanisms, either through a carbon tax or em emissions tra trading systems, ETS, can help decarbonize production procedures by, in by internalizing their environmental costs into production. And fourth, there is also a need to develop emissions accounting frameworks, accounting frameworks for traded products. Given transition requires, uh, green uh, transition requires a uh, consistent and ac accurate way uh, to measure the emissions embodied in goods and service, services across value chains. Uh, promoting green trade and investment is perhaps the most important means to develop green technologies and facilitate technological uh, spillovers. 
Uh, these efforts could include lowering tariffs on green goods and services and providing assistance to help uh, firms adopt greener technologies and uh, practices, facilita facilitating the transfer of green technologies across countries, particularly from developed to developing countries, is also crucial. The D uh, with uh, GVCs are playing an important role in that process. This will further require financial assistance and cooperation for capacity building and technology. Mm. Very interesting. You've listed a, a series of steps that are needed, especially the measuring of emissions in um, goods and mm. services and finding a, a mechanism to do that. Thank you for that. So, right, we have a, another question here. So, oh, oh, does anybody want to pick up on, on that particular question? No, I think that was kind of specifically to the Asian Development Bank. So this one has got a lot of votes. How can multilateral development banks ensure climate justice for countries disproportionately affected by climate change? Would you like to... I mean, you've already touched on what MDBs can do, but maybe you'd like to develop that thought, um, Rose um, yeah. Nakanaga. Can you do it again, please? How can multilateral development banks mm -hmm. ensure climate justice for countries disproportionately affected by climate change? Mm. Well, that's uh, what, from what we're experiencing, and I'm talking from a very small country with a very uh, thin revenue base, right? Mm. So when uh, when we en encounter these uh, climate change impacts, it's very difficult for us to use our own resources to remedy the needs that we want of course, to yeah. uh, help give the uh, enough or sufficient help to our own people. So um, probably uh, immediate assistance from the, uh, what, the banks mm. and uh, not concessional loans, but mostly grants will be needed mm. for our countries that are so mm. uh, low with uh, mm. income. You need the grants, not the concessional mm. loans. I mean, mm. and you need it fast, don't you? I mean, yeah. that's the key thing. You need to get access to these, uh, to the global, uh, you know, climate fund, as you said, and all the rest of it. Yes. Um, anybody else want to come in on that? Yes, please do. I think that so it's very important that uh, to minimize the risks of the climate change. So mm. one thing that the countries need quite fast assistance during the any significant uh, uh, case when, when there's a the climate case, case and there's a huge uh, need of the additional investment. That, that is the one case and of course the NDB's role, NDB's role here is the huge, including the other instruments other than the, the, the concessional finding because so the, there are, might be the cases that so the domestic resources might disproportionately low than, than the impact of the uh, climate change. That is the one direction that, of course, need, have, need to be addressed. And the second is that to, to, to work to prevent maximal, uh, maximally uh, to, uh, for the future to reduce the scale of the uh, expenditures. Mm. That, that's, that's prevention also something uh, very important. Uh, because so if you will invest in prevention something that may, may reduce your cost for the future several times. I think that, that that's mm. kind of the assessment and the expertise is also very needed to the countries with the lack of uh, resources. Very important point to make there, yes. Yes, please. Just one word. I think uh, talking of you know, uh, assistance or lending uh, coming from MDB is uh, uh, to, to deal with this issue, I think the balance between mitigation and adaptation is also important because, you know, for small island countries like uh, uh, you, mm -hmm. uh, the government of Naganaga, uh, you are really suffering from adaptation. So you need, you do need adaptation investment uh, with highly concessional or even grant money, right? Whereas uh, for, for larger countries, w which emit uh, a huge amount of you know, emissions, 
uh, mitigation is important. That's very interesting, you said, because you've anticipated one question that I have here already. You're a mind reader. <laughs> Should the Asian Development Bank prioritise finance for climate change mitigation or adaptation? Yeah, when uh, we announced our intention, our ambition uh, to provide $100 billion uh, from of cumulative climate financing between from 2019 to 2030, we also, at the same time, announced our intention uh, to, that at least one third of 100 billion ambition, which means 34 billion uh, US dollars, uh, should be invested in uh, adaptation. So one third in adaptation, two thirds in mitigation. Uh, but quite interestingly, if you look at our last year's figure, uh, we you know, committed uh, in total 9.8 billion dollars in uh, climate financing. Uh, with the breakdown of 5.5 billion in mitigation and 4.3 billion in adaptation. So it looks like a, a request for adaptation is more and more in the growing one of these. Right, so the balance is becoming a little bit more emphasis than you had anticipated yeah. on adaptation yeah. rather than mitigation. Pro probably because, I may be wrong, but probably because you know, people saw what happened in Pakistan two years ago. Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. Abul Hassan Mahmoud Ali from Bangladesh, Governor for Bangladesh, would you like to comment on that? I mean, in your view, Bangladesh has also had its um, climate challenges. Adaptation or mitigation, the priority? Well, I have a comment that uh, how do, who uh, will uh, uh, act as a uh, something like uh, will decide on, the a, arbiter. on a dispute. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you uh, get rid of that? I mean, is it uh, available there, right there? The, uh, let's say, the smaller countries or less powerful countries, if they want, can they get it? And then who will uh, uh, resolve the dispute? Mm. Right, well... You've answered a question with a question there, <laughs> Governor, so um, who knows? I'm far too diplomatic to uh, wade into that one. But anyway, let's, uh, let's go on to another question, which is, unless anybody wants to pick up on that, no. Fine. So um, you mentioned the European um, Union, uh, Governor Chutzishvili. So there's a question here, which is quite a few votes. Will the European Union's Green Deal, and in particular its carbon border, adjustment mechanism, CBAM, support or hinder climate-friendly globalization? I know you've only got candidate status, so you may wish to pass on that, but... Uh... Of course, that's, uh, that's something we're very important. Mm. And that's also very important for the candidate countries, mm. because it's, it's effect uh, for, for the future plans uh, as, as, as well, uh, for uh, the candidate countries. So, uh, that's the one part that the country is preparing for, for, for the membership. It means also that all the, all of the uh, legislation and the procedures that you should adopt uh, in, within your uh, legislation. So, and also you should be prepared uh, for, for, for this for, for, uh, for several years at least. So that, that's quite challenging for the, for, for, for the countries. Uh, uh, for the candidate countries, of course, but so the candidate countries here is not alone. So th there are several mechanisms and several schemes that, that, that helps them uh, uh, to make adaptation with this. So, of course, so that, that's something that actually takes time, takes resources, human and financial, but uh, at the end of the day, so everyone uh, receives the benefit of it. Thank you for that. So there's a vote here. Yeah, please, Sri Mulyani in the body. Well, the CBAM is not only for a country like Georgia, which is affecting, but the rest of the world, I think, is going to affect by this uh, kind of policy. The same thing like in the United States, you have the Inflation Reduction Act. What is the point is that uh, globally, the trade and investment is becoming so fragmented now and they are all governed by the interests of each country or region rather than have the what you call it uh, 
mutual benefiting for both uh, investors or trading partner. And that's become, uh, you ask whether this is a threat or an opportunity, definitely it, mm. it, the fragmentation will weaken the global economy. Mm. And that's become a threat for many countries in the world who try to develop themselves. And in the past, many, including Asia, just like President Asakawa mentioned, they can thrive to become an advanced country because they rely on globalization. Now, if globalization become fragmented, many countries which is not yet enjoy this benefit is going to prevent themselves to become the advanced country. The second one, it's also the compliance, as uh, uh, Minister uh, Lassa mentioned. It is quite a big in terms of the compliance and verification of all this uh, CBAM, carbon border adjustment. And that will create a cost of doing business for both the recipient as well as the exporter country. And uh, whether this is going to improve in terms of the carbon emission reduction, not necessarily, we don't know, we need to continue to look at this uh, issue within the context of whether we are going to be able as a world continue developing but less CO2. And this can, uh, will require a lot of multilateral and mm. global cooperation. Sure. So I, I think this is going to be one of the issues that need to be addressed at the forum, just like in the ADB, World Bank, IMF and other, or G20 also in this case. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you very much indeed, Shri Mulyani. So a question here that's garnered a lot of uh, support. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, hasn't there, about our global food farming practices and so on. And this question is, when talking about the green transition, does it also include transitioning our food system away from climate damaging animal agriculture towards sustainable plant based? A vegan, clearly, in our midst here. Um, and, and what is the ADB's role in this shift? So, who'd like to tackle that one? Transitioning our food system away from climate damaging animal agriculture. That assumes that um, animal agriculture is necessarily climate challenging and that the plant-based practices are not so damaging. I think I don't know whether this is responding directly to that, but for a country like Indonesia, also again, uh, we need to adjust the, the farming in order for us to see that it's now water becoming more and more scarce and, and that is also threatening the way the traditional agriculture, for example, like the rice field in Indonesia. So we currently work with MDBs uh, in order for us to be able to trans, uh, transforming the agriculture, the plantation of the rice with less water and less CO2 emission. I think that's going to be very impo important. The rice is becoming one of the most important staple good. Yeah. Uh, in Indonesia, we call it no rice, no glory. If you're not eating rice, you cannot function well. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it is shared also by the, our colleague from Japan. So, uh, continue producing rice, but less CO2 and less using uh, water. I think that's going to be very important. This is part of the oh. adaptation that we need to yeah. uh, look at it to support. Yeah. Anybody want to come in on that? Um, no. No? Okay, let's go to another one then. Urbanization is another challenge for the region with its increasing population. How can we create climate friendly and resilient cities? Okay, well, you've got a couple of minutes if you want to answer that big topic of climate and resilient friendly cities. But it's putting this issue of urbanization out there, and of course, that's a problem around the world, and we've seen that in Indonesia, of course, in Jakarta, but perhaps somebody else may wish to. Comment on that one? Urbanization has got to be, yeah? Actually, what, what Georgia is doing is something that's uh, investing quite a lot in the regions. Yeah. So, of course, they live, live, living in the capital city or the big cities, that's the, the uh, many advantage for, 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 for some population because it might be the case that living of the standard might be the higher than uh, in the regions in any country so that that's something that we, we are investing quite a lot in the in the regions to may make it even more, more attractive to to provide all the necessary services and uh, to to create uh, the places w w which will be the 
preferential to, 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 to leave the, for the populations. Of course, it includes uh, the project which is uh, very in favour of the climate uh, change. Okay. Rose Nakanaga, I won't come to you on that because your population is so wild, widely dispersed across your uh, many um, islands. Yes, Sri Muliani, thank you. I don't want to dominate, but maybe the size of Indonesia is big, so there yes. seems like a lot of example coming from us. But I think urbanization with, and climate change is important. Transport is the third largest after energy and forestry and land use in Indonesia. Yeah. So we are now investing quite a lot of mass rapid transit. Uh, if you want uh, for especially people to continue have the mobility but less CO2 emission, that means you have to provide with a good transport system. Yeah. Yeah. In this case, we are working with uh, Japan, with uh, China in building many of our uh, mass rapid transit uh, both within country, uh, within city as well as connecting in between city. I think that's very important, especially for countries like Indonesia, which have a huge population concentrated in one uh, island like Java Island. Sure. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, transport there. I mean, for you, Rose, and uh, Nakanaga, the um, decarbonisation of shipping is something which is very important to Micronesia, isn't it? Well, that's true. Uh, and it's shipping, I know it, I mean, it's uh, like gas, right? But it, it's very costly to, you know, uh, we currently are using uh, the ships to go to the islands. Yeah to uh, transport supplies. Yeah. And with that, we're using the diesel or the mm. fossil fuel to transport those things. We haven't think about going into renewable energy in that mm. area yet, so I, I'm sorry, but I, yeah. it's difficult for me to answer that. Question. Yeah, but I mean, you, you have answered it, so uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, we have some more questions here. Um, let's, yes, please do, uh, President Asakawa. Go back to the previous, uh, actually, question. Yeah, fine. Uh, yeah, actually, Minister Sulemiriani reminded me that uh, the importance of water in the long run, uh, because of the global warming, you know, glacier is melting, and uh, we, we have you know, less and less water resources every year. So over the long run, you know, the how to manage the water uh, mm. would be really crucial yeah. for everybody, and not only for agricultural products, products but for every you know, aspect mm. of our life. And uh, uh, that's continuously you know, threatening our you know, mm. lives and livelihoods. So that, that should be really recognized. Very interesting. I mean, water resources for plant-based agriculture is, is a very, very important um, factor. Um, gosh, let's see. We've got... Um, so anybody interested in this one? Since the world is lagging in its journey towards net zero, how do we ensure a truly climate-friendly globalization? What specific reforms are needed? Maybe just choose a couple that, you're, that you'd like to. Um, Abul Hassan Mahmoud Ali, are you interested in answering that one? How do we ensure a truly climate-friendly globalization? No? Anybody want to answer that one? Sri Muliani, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think the global, globalization uh, that work uh, in a fair and mutually benefiting is the rule-based globalization, because if it is not, then it will create uh, uncertainty. So the question is how you are going to create a rule base within this globalized system, but at the same time, we are going to uh, also comply with our effort or uh, consistent with our effort to reduce this climate change threat. What we could do is actually mainstreaming or putting this the rule base and including or designing built in within this rule base uh, how you are going to green the industry and the trade. And that's what uh, President Maza mentioned, global value chains uh, mm. that need to be certified. So it will create a right signal, a consistent signal for all who want to participate and get the benefit for, uh, from this globalization. I think this is going to be one of the most important. That means, that's it, 
uh, a lot of what you call it meeting which is affecting the rule base whether this is on a UN, whether this is related in WTO, whether this is in the IMF, World Bank annual meeting, or even on the financial sector like FSB and BIS, you actually can mainstream this, the greening of instrument policy regulation so that we are going to have a more certainty right. on the map uh, in the current and future for all countries to, to start to adjust. Okay, thank you. Um, President Asakawa, there's a question for you here. What is the ADB doing to help its member countries achieve the green transition? Uh, yeah, we have been very progressive, uh, aggressive about the green transition of member countries uh, by proposing a couple of really concrete uh, financial instruments. Uh, one of them is called uh, ETM. I don't know if you have ever heard of ETM, <laughs> which stands for Energy Transition Mechanism. Uh, which uh, also Minister Sri mentioned, uh, that was launched by ADB in 2021. Uh, it is intended uh, to accelerate the retirement of existing coal-fired power plants uh, in the region and the installation of renewable sources of uh, power generation. The mechanism, ETM, uh, uses uh, concessional funds to help mobilize large amount of commercial financing to retire or repurpose coal plants and catalyze new investment in clean energy, grid, and energy storage. In Indonesia, we are working seriously together uh, with our Indonesian counterparts to accelerate the retirement of a coal power plant in West Java called Chilego 1, 660 megawatts, by almost seven years, aiming to close the transaction this year, I hope. Uh, we are also working to uh, initiate feasibility studies while building project pipelines in other countries. Uh, given the large climate financing gaps and region, uh, the region faces, we are further innovating uh, to draw in regional and global partners to scale up climate investments, including the private sector. Uh, for this purpose, uh, we, are, we have launched so-called IFCAP, which stands for Innovative Finance Facility for Climate in Asia and Pacific, IFCAP which is a very innovative uh, financial instrument to increase our uh, ADB's uh, uh, climate investment by utilizing bilateral donors guarantee, which means whenever one dollar of any ADB sovereign uh, operations is guaranteed by any donors, we can expand our you know, uh, uh, climate investment accordingly. But the beauty of this mechanism is that it's not really conventional one dollar in, one dollar out uh, financial modality. Uh, if one dollar is guaranteed under our simulation, uh, we can uh, uh, expand four dollars or even five dollars of uh, uh, climate investment. So it can be leveraged uh, that much. So through ETM and the IFCAP and those uh, and other initiatives, we intend to provide regional economies with the knowledge and financial means to enable a smooth transition to a growing economy. That's what we are trying to do. Thank you. And now just your closing remarks. We've no more time for any more pigeonhole questions. All of you, uh, panel, in the order in which you spoke, just how confident are you, how optimistic are you that we can reinvent globalization to make it uh, climate friendly? Um, Governor Lasha Khotsishvili of Georgia. So confidence is quite high mm -hmm. because uh, actually what, what we need is that uh, all the uh, stakeholders here, uh, including the government, MDBs, financial institutions, uh, private uh, business as well, mm. and other, other stakeholders, it's very important to work very in a coordinated manner, because this, this process actually requires quite high coordination, and of course it, 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 it takes time, it takes resources, but with the efficient ways, the efficient, the efficient steps, so it's uh, quite achievable, and that something gives the uh, quite promising background. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, Governor Rose Nakanaga for Micronesia. I don't want to trivialise things, but there's that ABBA song, isn't there? Money, money, money. So, how can you get hold of it? 
<laughs> to make globalization work for you, yeah. Well, <laughs> I guess you put it quite simple but, or, and true, because we are uh, a new government. I mean, uh, the country is kind of new, so we're all struggling. It's very interesting hearing from the uh, other nations that are doing well. Our role, we, we do have, uh, we believe in globalization. And what we, we see are uh, contributions to some of these things. Uh, when uh, the big countries come fish in our, country, you know, in our oceans, they, uh, but we, we do look for uh, that. I'm really coming from the, what's called the climate change angle that uh, the emissions, if they're uh, reduced, and because of the fact that we are being affected by the climate change, our countries are small and dispersed, like we mentioned. Mm. And what we can do is try to adapt mm -hmm. <laughs> to the changes instead of, because uh, there is nothing we can do to con stop the yeah. changes on our countries. So I guess we look forward to the big countries to kind of help us. Yeah. You want to move from just disaster management yeah. to actually to building in resilience in mm -hmm. your economies. Running out of time, but I'll come to you, Abu Hassan Mahmoud Ali for Bangladesh. How confident climate friendly globalization? Briefly. How come what? How confident are you about climate friendly globalization from your perspective? How optimistic? <laughs> How common? Confident, optimistic. Oh, confident. Oh, that, that varies. Case to case, there is no uh, absolute confidence. Okay, there's no absolute confidence. Got it there, yeah, yes. So, <laughs> thank <laughs> you. I did say brief, so <laughs> thank you. Confidence is not something absolute. Okay. Yeah. Sri Muliani Indrawati, your final comment, please. I think, judging from the history, I'm optimistic and confident. Uh, people and countries, they are quite rational, so there is always uh, a signal that we need to change, and I think this is already being received by a uh, policymaker. Uh, basis of my confidence is actually the younger generation, the generation millennial, XYZ, they are more and more have this ownership that the future is belong to us and we need to fix many things which is not yet fixed. So I have a full and strong confidence. President Massa, so your final comment, please, in the okay. government seminar. Well, Asian economies, like we discussed today, Asian economies will continue to be a crucial part of global uh, production networks and be important participants in global value chains. Uh, but we must keep in mind that it comes with the growing responsibility uh, to ensure that global and regional value chain uh, become ever more environmental friendly. As the Climate Bank for Asia and Pacific, ADB uh, remains committed to supporting this transition by using our convening power, our financing instruments like I, I mentioned, and our technical expertise to pave the way for more effective low carbon development. So I firmly believe we can work together to make a carbon neutral future a reality. And we must work together to create a region that is both greener and ensure more resilient, sustainable economic growth for all. Thank you. Well, translating those words that all of you have expressed into action is the uh, thing now. We've heard your rallying cry. So that's the end of this governor's seminar towards climate-friendly globalization. It seems to me that uh, no absolute confidence, Abul Hassan Mahmoud Ali, but quite a bit of uh, optimism around here. Thank you all very much indeed for coming, and thank you to everybody here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.